we're constantly asking ourselves this question of what the internet means to us. But what are we to the internet? Through the lens of feudal systems, we were called serfs. Then the monarchy called us subjects. The electoral system labelled us voters. And now industrial capitalism calls us consumers. Because every new technology opens a new realm where we can be something we've never been before. And in that new realm, we get to redefine ourselves. It took us a long time to get to this word citizen. And even now, our institutions continue to relabel us because this notion of citizenship isn't fixed. It evolves. In fact, each generation has to redefine what citizenship means, deciding what rights, powers, and capabilities the greatest number of people should have. We have the most powerful technologies ever, and as a result, our generation, perhaps more than any other, will have to radically reinvent what we think a citizen is. Today, our technologies are extraordinary. They let us know more about ourselves and the world around us than ever before. They give us superpowers, the ability to participate in our own evolution. We can fly in the eyes of a drone. We can ride a roller coaster in our bedroom. We can become an avatar and live in another world. But like it or not, Many of these technologies are not just commodities. They are challenging and fundamentally changing our civic frameworks, our laws, our privacy, our economy, our labor. Many of these technologies are 21st century infrastructures. So who controls these technologies? Who writes the code? Who owns the data? And what do these technologies see us as? They don't see us as citizens. In fact, they don't even see us as consumers. Most of the time, they just see us as data clusters. Because each time we use a connected product or service, we produce a tsunami of personal data. I mean, it's huge. It's like each of us sending 27 million tweets every day. And companies are aggressively mining this data because our data fuels their business. Companies make huge profits from processing our data and selling it to advertisers, data brokers, and other organizations. The problem is we have absolutely no control over our data. We don't get to say who collects it, what they can do with it, where it goes, even where it's stored. And as a result, we all have gigabytes of data fragmented across the internet, collected in centralized silos that are held out of our reach. And the granularity and quantity of data that is being collected is about to explode with the impending internet of things, where all objects around us become connected to the internet and data conscious. So it will become very difficult to distinguish when you're on the internet or off the internet, because we won't experience the internet just through screens anymore. The internet will be embedded in everything, in your kettle, your toaster, your breadboard, your pots and your pans. And this means that Google won't just know when you've brushed your teeth, but when you've had sex, <laughs> and who with. <laughs> In the Internet of Things, more data will be collected every day than has ever been collected. And this data will go to this same deeply dysfunctional data model we have today. It's dysfunctional because it's bad for democracy, because we have no say in where our data goes or what it's used for, and we certainly can't use it ourselves. We don't have access to it. But it's also really bad for business, because it leaves companies competing 
to become the monopoly of the information economy. So companies invest in technologies designed to gather as much personal data about us as possible. And that data gets stuck in these data silos. So technologies by different companies just don't talk to one another. It's why we have so many black boxes in our homes. We have routers and Sonos boxes and gateways. All because the technology doesn't talk. They're not interoperable. In the 20th century, our infrastructures were roads, transport networks, electricity. Infrastructures built for the common good and designed to keep innovation with open design standards. Now in the 21st century, our infrastructures are Google, Uber, Twitter. These are monopolies, private companies that work solely in the interests of a very narrow venture capital investment model. The products and services they support have very little to do with citizenship and everything to do with their business interests. The only option we get is to opt in or opt out, and we know that's not much choice at all. We used to get products with instruction manuals. Now we get a product and an app and terms and conditions. And when we sign up to those terms and conditions, we don't just sign away our data. We sign up to these really strange social contracts. For instance, the Samsung Smart TV recently had, within its terms and conditions, a clause that said, anything said within earshot of the TV may be recorded and sent to third parties as part of the voice recognition service. So you have to be careful of what you say in front of your TV, because <laughs> it might gossip more than your next door neighbour. I mean, the point is we're just not building a better future for ourselves right now. So what could we do about it? One option is that we just keep going and we do nothing. But that means we're headed to a future where our infrastructures are centralised, vulnerable and deeply undemocratic. We're heading to a future where we may have abundance and automation, but fewer of us will have a job and everything will be owned by just one or two companies. And that's some dystopia. So think about this. We could just pull the plug, turn technology off, but then guess what? No Facebook. <laughs> Many of us would be unwilling to live a life disconnected. And in fact, for many of us, it's impossible to do so because our lives depend on us being online. Think about this. We could just go darknet. We could digitally conceal ourselves and become anonymous, regain our data by concealing ourselves. It sounds seductive, but actually I think anonymity offers us false choice. Because anonymity doesn't just protect dissent and in an anarchy criminals thrive, but anonymity would stop us enjoying what we like doing online. So posting photos, writing comments, getting our online shopping delivered to our door the next day. We couldn't do any of that. And let's face it, we are living in post-Snowden times, and security through obscurity is just not OK anymore. We need transparency for democracy. We could demand our rights with a digital Magna Carta. This is Tim Berners-Lee's vision where we have a bill that recognises our data as part of our human rights. It's a really important idea, it's powerful, and it's a really great provocation. But it's limited. I think it's limited because it ignores the structural causes of the problem. It just treats the symptoms. I think it's an old world answer where we bring a legal document and demand our rights. I think we need an evolution, not a revolution. And for that, I think we should look to the coding community, because I believe they've been developing a solution that deals not just with the symptoms, but with the causes too. And I think it might just change everything. 
It's decentralization. It's the technical redistribution of power from one central authority to everyone. It gives us the potential to change the way we transact, participate, and trust. Decentralization is happening across a range of markets using different technologies. From FireChat, the messaging service that operates on a mesh network, which means we don't need a Wi-Fi connection to communicate. To the Tesla Powerwall that promises decentralized power for cities. To Bitcoin, the digital currency powered by the blockchain that allow us to, allows us to complete financial transactions without the need of intermediaries. But for decentralization to really work, I think we need to take a step back and look at what happens beneath the technologies to consider its civic framework. So what if we were to take the same principles of decentralization and apply them to our data? How would it change things if we flipped the data paradigm and we owned our own data? Let me tell you. We could have open standards for data. I think we could build federated data licenses that are nested in code. And to show you what this might look like, I've got this example. So we're going to take our biometric data. And the first thing we would do to set up our license would be to claim if we wanted to share that data or not. Then who we wanted to share that data with what they could do with our data, and whether we would allow them to share our data with like-minded institutions under the same terms. And by answering these four straightforward questions, we generate a license for that particular data type. And these licenses are super powerful because they're made up of human, legal, and machine-readable code. So they're like terms and conditions, but version two, but only better. Because this time round, we set the rules of engagement. It means we move from being just data producers to active citizens. And these licenses are also really good for businesses because it means we're actively sharing our data with them. So they no longer have to compete to mine our data. They can concentrate on building the best products and services for us we would have an abundance of all sorts of data shared under standard licenses. And with your permission, this could be shared and stored in data commons, online resources available to anyone and owned by everyone. We already have some of these data commons, like Wikipedia or um, the Creative Commons. These are pl places where we can participate, learn, produce, not just consume but there are a myriad of possibilities of what public space online could look like that we haven't even started thinking of yet. The technology for our licenses and these data commons could be hosted by new civic institutions for the internet because no government or corporate company could be a custodian of these. We need the BBC, but for the internet. Now, you might be thinking, this all sounds great, but ultimately, who pays for it? Well, that's a tricky question right now, but we do have options, from crowdfunding to different forms of investment. But do you know what? I think we'll find the answer to that question. I think it's more important that we concentrate now on designing and testing these decentralized technologies and their civic frameworks to demonstrate their value. We need to build a case for change, and we need to start investigating business models that operate outside of the information economy, that let us see past this centralized singularity to a future of innovative, open technologies that empower us all. Who controls the technology? Who writes the code and who owns the data? Maybe the answer should be all of us. Because this isn't a discussion about whether Google or Facebook are good or bad. It's about being bothered about our data. 
It's about being proactive and deciding the future we want. It's about deciding whether it's going to be this centralized world or a world of innovation. And I think it's really important because we are the first generation to have the opportunity to write a better definition of citizenship than we inherited. We are the first generation to have the opportunity of writing what it is to be a citizen, not just in legal code, but in actual code. Thank you.